The duty with regard to the Third Noble Truth is to realize it, to realize that there is a dimension totally free of suffering. It's unchanging, blissful, the type of consciousness that has no object, no restrictions, what the Buddha calls unrestricted awareness. And it's the best thing there is. As a John Mahabharata once said, if you could take Nirvana out and show it to other people, no one want anything else. We don't talk about the duty with regard to this truth, because it depends on the, the duties of the other ones, the other noble truths. In other words, you have to comprehend suffering. First, you have to abandon craving. You have to develop the path to finally reach that realization. In particular, the act of abandoning craving is part of the definition of the Third Noble Truth. But the Third Noble Truth also plays an important role in our inspiration, our motivation for taking on the duties with regard to the other Noble Truths. We have to want to go there. So it's good to realize that it really is something positive. The Buddha said, if you think there's anything negative at all about Nibbana, anything negative at all about attaining this truth, this wrong view. It's totally positive. So it's good to think about that, because it is an alternative. We hold on to our old ways, largely because we think there is no alternative. The Buddha showed us that there is, and it can be attained through our own efforts. So he talks about it enough to give us a desire to go there. After all, desire is the root of all dhammas. Even the path is based on desire. And of course, all the things we do that lead to suffering are based on desire. The only thing that is not based on desire is Nibbana itself. But to get there, you have to desire to put the path together. This is in line with the first verse in the Dhammapada. All Dhammas are, have the mind as the forerunner. They're achieved through the mind. In other words, the mind is proactive. It's because we sense the truth, even though we may not know it fully, that we give so much credence to our cravings. Because we know it's through our desires that we can get things done. Now the question is, do they get done well? Do they get done to our satisfaction? The Buddha's coming in and saying, not really. You should look at the things that you could desire here in the world, or in any world. Either you don't get what you desire, and there's that suffering, or else there's the suffering that comes when you do get what you desire, and, you turn, and it turns out to be disappointing. There's always going to be that disappointment. This is why the Buddha has us think about the, those perceptions of inconstancy, stress, not self. And so we have to learn what kind of desires we should follow and which ones we shouldn't. The Buddha gives us some guidance in his list of the different kinds of emotions, and he divides into household-based emotions and renunciation-based emotions. Each type has three. There's joy or happiness, grief or distress, and then equanimity. And for most of us, we just kind of muck around in the household emotions. We get what we want for a while, and then we don't get what we want. And so we struggle to go back and get some more of what we like. In other words, we go back and forth between household distress and household happiness. But it's never really satisfying. Now, if we felt that that was all there was in the world, we'd put up with it, or we'd desire that we don't want it at all. We've had enough of this, and just hope for annihilation. But that hope for annihilation, the Buddha discovered that too, it leads to more becoming, in other words, more experiences of happiness and distress on the household level. And household here doesn't mean only human households, deva households, brahma households. It's all on the same level, as far as the Buddha is concerned. 
he says there's something else, so we don't have to keep mucking around in, in those emotions. And it starts, this something else, starts with what he calls renunciation to stress. When you have a longing for an unexcelled liberation, you ask yourself, oh, when will I be able to dwell in that dimension in which the noble ones dwell already? In other words, you see that it is a possibility, or you believe that it is a possibility. You see there are noble ones who have attained that dimension. And the distress there simply is the fact that you're not there yet. But as the Buddha said, this is much better than trying to go for household happiness. If there's household distress, go for renunciation distress, realizing that okay, here I'm suffering from the ways of the world. But going back and trying to find happiness in the world, it's not that desirable. Something totally free from those limitations would be more desirable. But it means, of course, that there's a path you have to follow. But that conviction is what leads to the good path. Think about the Buddha's analysis of what's called transcendent dependent core rising, where he goes through all the factors of dependent core rising and gets to suffering. And he doesn't stop with suffering. The next factor is conviction. In other words, you finally decide, okay, there must be a way out. And then you start practicing the way, and that way gives rise to joy. This is an important element of the path. There's the joy of being virtuous, there's the joy of concentration, and there's the joy of insight. When you see that the things that you used to be a slave to are not worth it, and you can rise above them, so you're no longer attracted to them. There's a strong sense of freedom that comes with that. When you attain, when you attain the goal, there's an equanimity that goes along with that. The goal itself is not equanimity. The goal, is, of course, as the Buddha said, is the highest happiness, the highest bliss. But then you look back at all the things that used to weigh the mind down. And you can be equanimous about them. As the Buddha said, you're disjoined from them. So they make no inroads on the mind. So it's realizing there is this alternative. That's what gives hope to our lives. Because otherwise, if this alternative were not there, then it would simply be a matter of personal preference. Do you like going for the pleasures of the world? Are you tired of that? And it's really up to you to decide. But when the Buddha says there's something much better, you owe it to yourself to give it a try. It's because of this something that's much better that the contemplations of inconstancy, stress, and not-self really work. Again, if everything that could be experienced were inconstant, stressful, and not-self, You'd say, well, I'll go for it, or I may not go for it. That's all there is. But it's because there's something else that's not inconstant, not stressful, and is beyond perceptions of self or not self. One of its epithets is the permanent. It's kind of ironic. There are people who say, even believing that there is anything at all possible in human experience that could be permanent is an eternalistic view. But the Buddha never said that thinking that anything at all was permanent was eternalism. He said thinking that the self is eternal, that's eternalism, that would be a wrong view. But with Nirvana, it's permanent, it's actually outside of time, so eternal isn't even a good word for it. But it is unchanging, and it is because of that unchanging dimension that the three characteristics actually work. In other words, believing that they would lead you to something unchanging is why you apply them, why you apply those perceptions to all the things that you could crave, all the things that you could cling to. So it's for the sake of this that we try to comprehend suffering, abandon the cause, which is craving, and then we develop the path. This is what gives meaning to all the other noble truths, and what makes them noble. 
Remember the Buddhist definition of a noble search is for something that's deathless, free from aging, free from illness, free from death. And it's this third noble truth that satisfies that criterion. And it's this truth that makes all the other truths noble as well. So it's for the sake of realizing this truth that we're sitting here meditating. And let that inspire you. That alternative is there. We tend to think that it's superhuman. But after all, the Buddha came to teach human beings. It's like that story they tell of Richard Feynman. Someone had written to him one time after learning that Richard Feynman liked to play the bongos. And he said, this, is, this makes you human. And Feynman was offended. He wrote back and he says, doing physics is actually human as well. In the same way. Suffering is human, that's true. Having craving is human. But the fact that we can, through our efforts, find total release from suffering, totally realize the cessation of suffering, that's what makes it worthwhile to be human. <laughs>